Ethical Perspectives on the News is produced by the Interreligious Council of Lynn County, which is solely responsible for its content. The views and opinions expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect those of the staff and management of KCRG TV9. Good morning, and welcome to Ethical Perspectives on the News. I'm the Reverend Heather Hayes from First Presbyterian Church in Cedar Rapids, and I'll be our moderator for this morning's show. The subject of this morning's discussion is co-opting culture, or trying to navigate the differences between a type of cultural appropriation that some might be considered consider harmful and what some others might consider as cultural appreciation. This past summer, some of the headlines surrounded the fact that five Native Americans won a lawsuit against the Washington Redskins franchise, which resulted in them losing six trademark registrations. That decision is now an appeal and being battled out in the courts. At the same time, in pop culture, stars such as Pharaoh Williams and Ellie Goulding have had criticisms brought against them for wearing Native American headdresses in photo shoots. And at some musical festival venues, the wearing of headdresses have been banned despite their growing popularity amongst hipster cultures. This is far from a new issue, and a cry against borrowing from cultures has happened and arisen time and again. But there are others, however, that suggest that it is the very nature of humanity to borrow from one another bits of culture that seem useful or beautiful, and that imitation is a way of appreciation and even can be a part of an art form. Helping us navigate the questions this evening are our panelists. Kristen Hudson from Coe College, the Chaplain and Director of Diversity and Inclusion. Welcome, Kristen. Thanks. We have Jason Rantanen, an Associate Professor of Law at the University of Iowa. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. And Thomas Oates, who is an Assistant Professor of American Studies at the University of Iowa. Nice to Again, be here. Welcome. Well, Jason, since I opened this morning with the Washington Redskins case, would you be able to share with us a little bit about that case from a legal perspective? This is not a recent complaint that has been uh, brought up against the Redskins name and mascot, but is the first challenge that to the team name that has been successful in any way, shape, or form. Can you give us a little about the approach that was taken in this particular instance? Sure. Well, to talk about that, I first need to talk about what a trademark is. So a trademark is essentially the right to exclude others from using a particular mark or particular designation on goods or services. And the way that an entity makes money using a trademark is that it labels its products or its services using that mark, and when it sells its products, customers know, aha, this particular product came from this particular manufacturer. With sports teams, it works very similarly. And people buy goods, they buy t-shirts, they buy Washington Redskins tickets because they know that they're going to get a quality football team that they've enjoyed watching for years and years and years. And that's how Washington makes its money. Now, what would happen if another person were to start selling Washington Redskins paraphernalia? Say, for example, um, they started selling jerseys that had Washington Redskins on it. Well, they could do so really cheaply because they wouldn't have to pay the players, right? And so they could just sell the trademark jerseys and they would be able to make lots of money doing what we call counterfeiting. Um, so that's essentially what trademark law allows. Trademark law allows companies who hold a particular trademark to say to other people, you know, no, no, you can't use this mark on your own commercial goods or services. Now, what happened in this particular case was that the plaintiffs here, which were five Native Americans, challenged the Washington Redskins federal trademark registration. And what that would mean, if, the, if they successfully go all the way through all of the appeals, is that the Washington Redskins wouldn't be able to call upon that federal trademark registration to prevent other people from using the mark. Now, there's a whole bunch of legal complexities. It wouldn't, for example, destroy all of the Washington Redskins' ability to stop others from using their various different marks. Um, there are state law 
law protections. There are um, unregistered mark protections. There's a variety of other protections. But what it would do is it would substantially weaken the Washington Redskins' trademark protection. Right? They would not have the same strength of trademark protection that, say, the New York Yan Yankees would have. Um, and that's the, the, the heart of the legal strategy here. It's to reduce the value of the Washington Redskins trademark, reduce the value of their ability to call themselves the Washington Redskins by weakening their trademark pr uh, protection. Okay. So they're not actually um, able to, they weren't actually able to f force a hand, in, in some sense, a change of the name, but are, by taking away that monetary value, they're hoping to encourage, perhaps, the team to take a second look at um, how they're naming the team and the mascot. Exactly. It's more like a nudge mm -hmm. than a, you can't do that. Right? So the, a, a big difference about the, the way that the trademark law works is that in this instance, what we're talking about is the Washington Redskins' ability to prevent others from using this particular trademark, not whether or not the Washington Redskins themselves can actually use that particular mark. Right? We need a different set of laws to say to the Washington Redskins, no, 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 you can't use Redskins in your team name. Right? That would be a different set of laws um, unless there happened to be an earlier user of that particular mark, which isn't the case here. Mm -hmm. And why did why was this particular um, uh, suit successful? What was the what was the Sure. So the reason why it was successful um, is because a lot of creative people and a lot of dedicated plaintiffs and have made it their mission. Uh, prosecuting litigation, right, to be an attorney, or to, to successfully prosecute a suit like this, particularly a cause-based suit like this, takes a lot of resources. It takes a lot of willpower, right, because you've got an opponent who's making money off this particular product. Um, who's opposing you, right? You have to fight for a long period of time. This particular um, attack on the Washington Redskins mark has actually gone back to the early 1990s. So the very first legal strategy of this uh, type was um, initiated by a woman named Susan Harjo, and she filed the first petition to cancel the Washington Redskins mark back in the early 1990s. And that petition was actually successful. The, um, like here, the Patent and Trademark Office said we're going to cancel this particular mark, this set of mar six marks. We're going to cancel the federal trademark registration. Um, and then, just like in this situation, the Washington Redskins filed their appeal to, in this case, to the district courts, and were able to get the um, district courts and the appellate courts to say, no, that suit, you sh waited too long to bring that suit. This is the second in that whole series of litigations. This particular one avoids the problem, the procedural issue that was involved in the first suit um, because it's brought by a group of very young um, plaintiffs, people who had just crossed their age and maturity and so weren't around for 20 or 30 years while the Washington Redskins were using the mark. It's a doctrine called latches in, in law. Um, and so this particular suit may be successful, at least it's much less likely to, to, um, to fail on the grounds of latches, on the grounds that the plaintiffs waited too long while the Washington team was using their mark. And, and part of that underlying is that uh, the underlying argument is that this mark um, can be revoked because it is disparaging to this particular group and they haven't had a chance to, I guess with their age, haven't had a chance to push back against that. That right, and so their argument in terms of delay is that we couldn't bring this cause of action, we couldn't bring this cancellation proceeding until we reach the age of majority, which is 18. Um, and within a relatively short period of time after we turned 18, we did in fact file this suit and try, can't try to cancel the mark on the grounds that it is disparaging. It's one of the grounds on which a, a registration can be refused or a mark can be canceled, uh, this ground of disparagement. Mm -hmm. So I would say that maybe perhaps that uh, people who are hearing about this particular, particular suit might say, oh yes, I can see how the Washington Redskins 
the the trademark, the mascot, you know, some of the antics of the crowds uh, during any given game might be considered disparaging against Native American culture. But there are many more uses of other kinds of cultural touchstones that um, aren't readily identified as um, being offensive, um, although they may be considered offensive to the, the cultures that they are, are coming from. Um, some um, have pointed to America as, oh, well, we're a big melting pot here. We are always constantly borrowing from one another. And so I'm wondering, Thomas, um, if you could give us a, a little bit of what you might see as both um, the benefits of that kind of cultural uh, crossover or in some of the pitfalls. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that uh, in a multicultural society like the United States, um, cultural exchange is just going to be a fact of life. Um, it has been a fact of life uh, for as long as people have been living together in the United States. Um, the benefits can be uh, really significant uh, for individuals and for communities who share experiences deep in understandings uh, with one another. Um, but there are uh, possible pitfalls, as we see in the case with the uh, Redskins. Um, in particular, uh, there are always going to be relations of power involved where um, uh, cultural exchange is, is uh, being enacted. And those relations of power always need to be carefully considered. Um, issues of representation um, and who can represent whom um, and to which audience and with what effect um, are, are always going to be um, aspects of that appropriation that need to be taken seriously. Um, and in the, with respect to the Redskins case, um, we're talking about, of course, a very long history of uh, the white mainstream appropriating and using images of Native Americans uh, for various commercial purposes, which is what the Redskins are doing as well. Um, Redskins are one of the wealthiest sports organizations in the world. Um, and they're appropriating imagery from a, a set of communities that have been um, uh, uh, oppressed by U.S. policy for a very long time. There's still very high rates of poverty, uh, very high rates of um, um, uh, alcoholism in Native American communities, very low rates of uh, uh, high school graduation and other kinds of deep social problems. Um, that need to be uh, addressed. Um, and so where those um, appropriations are happening without any sort of regard for those sets of power relations, um, I, I think they can become very problematic. And you can see this in the comparison that defenders of the Redskins name often make uh, to the uh, Notre Dame Fighting Irish, right? Well, the difference in that comparison is, of course, who's doing the naming um, who's being represented, what other kinds of, what diversity of representation exists for that group outside of that one particular representation, um, and so on. So um, those are all aspects that I think uh, can create problems when they're not um, taken seriously as issues. Well, uh, to kind of continue on with that thought then, uh, and this could, we could open this up to everyone, but what kinds of um, responsibilities do you think that um, a dominant culture has then towards the non-dominant cultures that exist alongside of it? Do you want to take that? Well, I just need to sort of just kind of say out loud that even as we think about the composition of this panel, and we're talking about power structures and we're talking about the impact that um, cultural appropriation might have on marginalized groups, yet from the face of it, it doesn't look like even we are people that can speak to this. Mm -hmm. Because I, I know that I belong to a dominant group and I experience a lot of privilege as I walk through life. And so just even thinking about who's at the table as we discuss how do we have this kind of discourse and whose voices are being included and whose voices are being um, not at the table, not, not shared. Left out. Left out, yep. So that's just, as we think about what is our responsibility as part of the dominant culture to, to really be thinking about how do we um, share perspective and, and really tend towards um, considering critically how the images that we appropriate, like the Redskins, has a systematic impact on generations of people. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really interesting that we're using like a legal system um, 
to approach this subject when in fact we need a cultural shift. Like we need to decide that this is inappropriate and that we can't continue to create images that are disparaging like they are with the Redskins and the Florida State Seminoles and the behaviors and the Atlanta Braves and some of the ways that we cheer on our favorite sports teams and the impact that that must have. Mm -hmm. Although I can't speak for it because I'm not Native American, but I can imagine the impact that would have on our sisters and brothers who identify as American Indian. Mm -hmm. Well, and I guess that brings, um, brings us back uh, to your, as you were explaining, kind of the legal gymnastics that mm -hmm. went about to even just put in um, to to create uh, a, a slight disadvantage to this trademark, um, not even beginning to be able to say that offends us and we you know we can prohibit you. And as I understand it, there there really isn't that kind of set of laws. So we do have. Oh, so we should distinguish a little okay. bit between a cultural shift and mm -hmm. a legal shift. Right. So. Keep in mind that this this move, this legal move, is part of the broader mm -hmm. cultural shift uh, that we're talking about here. It's a central part of that particular strategy. Cultural shifts take a really long time, typically. Right? Very few cultural shifts happen tomorrow or next year, or even in a decade. Right? They take a really long time to see uh, to play out. What the law lets us do is make shorter-term changes. Right? So mm -hmm. that's a um, one of the reasons why a legal strategy is in some sense effective here is because it operates on the span of even a really long, complicated litigation that takes 15 years is still faster than cultural change. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's one reason why, why the law operates in this particular context. Another way is that it focuses attention on this particular issue. It's part of saying, hey, look, this is offensive. This is a cultural problem that needs to be addressed. And the law lets us, hey, here's a focal point. Right? Here's a point where we can now talk about this issue. It's come to the forefront. Maybe we disagree, but now we can have a conversation about it. The law is very much highlighting it. I think those two pieces are, are very much part of the legal strategy. The legal strategy on its own is not a cultural shift. Mm -hmm. It's a way of, of responding or starting or addressing that cultural shift or maybe having some effect outside the scope of a cultural shift. Well, Kristen, I wanted to go back to you here a little bit. Uh, in your position as chaplain and especially as the director of diversity and inclusivity at CO, um, I'm sure you get to see where cultures, uh, different cultures that uh, mm -hmm. you, uh, young people are bringing with them to college, different understandings uh, come head to head uh, on a day to day yeah. basis and that kind of stretching and learning. What are your thoughts? Or as yeah, well, first of all, I'm just really thrilled to be able to announce that CO has the most diverse students population in its history. 28% um, of our incoming class identifies as non-Anglo, so it's really exciting, but it also creates a big challenge too. Like how do we as a small liberal arts college in Iowa start to recognize the need to be creating um, opportunity and venue for students of every background and tradition to be able to live out their life and their culture in the context at Coe College. So it's pretty exciting, but it's mm -hmm. also challenging. Um, I think it's kind of interesting that this coming Monday at Co, we actually have a Native American woman who's coming to speak. Mm -hmm. And we call it the, um, it's called the American Indian Alternative Thanksgiving Dinner. And we'll be serving traditional Native American cuisine. And she's going to be giving us a history 101 about um, what, how reservations came about and the implications they've had for generations of American Indians. And um, talking about her own experience as an educator, she's been on the school board in uh, Twin Cities for, for over a dozen years. And so she's just this great opportunity for our students from every background to really think critically about this Thanksgiving holiday, about our history as a, as a country with our, our first tribal nations here, mm -hmm. um, and do some of that reorientation around this time of the year and how we need to start being really thoughtful about things like the Washington Redskins and the other teams. So that's an example of how we do programming around these kinds of issues of diversity and inclusion. Um, but we also rely on some of our students to help us create where we have voids and to help us do the education so that we're not doing it from the top down, again, about power, and sort of inviting people to the table and say what's missing in our curriculum, what's missing in our program, what are we not thinking about when it comes to housing and food issues on campus because we're a residential college. Mm -hmm. So that's another way of thinking about inclusion is who's at the table making some of those decisions. 
That's very exciting stuff. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. Um, it is. Um, so as we as we continue on um, thinking about this, we've talked a little bit about, um, or actually quite a bit about the the negativities. What are some of the um, positive pieces of being able to uh, share across cultural boundaries? What are the um, the benefits of doing so? Um, well, and allowing parts of our own culture to be shared in respectful ways. Yeah, I, I, I think we just heard one great example right there. Um, I think uh, one of the sort of prerequisites for that kind of really positive exchange is allowing members of communities to speak for themselves mm -hmm. and creating venues where they can speak for themselves rather than speaking for them. Um, and ensuring that representations uh, uh, collect and relay uh, the full depth of the human experience that these groups are experiencing. Um, and that's very difficult for an outsider to do. Um, um, and so creating opportunities for more people to speak um, and to share their experiences is, um, is, is one way forward, I think. Um, that's very difficult in a media system like ours, which is um, uh, controlled by uh, a very small number of people with a very lot of money. Um, uh, but there are, of course, interpersonal uh, opportunities and there are opportunities in communities like at Co College, University of Iowa, and other mm -hmm. places like that to, uh, um, to explore these things in a, in a more diverse way. Well, you know, when you, when you were talking about the media, um, I, as I was researching and looking into this topic, uh, I think it was, uh, there was a, a group of Native American um, uh, tribes that banded together in California and uh, put together a, a three minute uh, video mm -hmm. that showed the diversity of what Native American culture is. Mm -hmm. And they really did that as a learning piece and then played it during a Giants game. Mm -hmm. But it took, you know, I don't even, I can't even guess how many hundreds of thousands of dollars to make that one three minute statement as broad as it may be. Mm -hmm. So that is, that is a definite challenge, but also an opportunity. Right, and, and this is one of the larger challenges, I think, is that, um, uh, thinking about justice in terms of representation means thinking about justice in terms of social resources and the availability of social resources. And so um, uh, you can't really solve one problem without solving the other. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think um, another, another angle at this too is um, the artistic communities mm -hmm. and the ways in which art can also be um, made a venue uh, of beginning to make that cultural shift, much as you know, you pointed to the the law as being a little piece in a, a much bigger strategy that's going to take a very long time. But the ways in which artists can share one another across uh, a different cultural boundaries, and then we get some very wonderful we can get very wonderful collaborations. Um, yeah, so, so art represents one of the challenges of cultural appropriation in almost in a microcosm, if we just focus in on art. So one of the, the challenges we have with things like cultural appropriation is that our entire society today is built up on cultural appropriation. Right? Everything that we are is, in a sense, appropriated from, from somebody others, else. From or somebody right, else. a compilation of. Or a compilation, yeah. right? Yeah. It comes from somebody else. And so our even fundamental societies is our elements of them are appropriated from Anglo -Euro European systems, from um, civil law systems, from English law systems, right? We pick in, we have all these elements that have been appropriated from past people. So that's one of the challenges with coming up and developing some sort of law in this area about cultural appropriation is that we have some really, really, really hard line drawing questions. We have some really hard questions about what is the thing that's being appropriated. And art, exemplifies that. So you're mentioning mm -hmm. borrowing, right? <clears throat> the idea that artists like to be able to share. Well, artists like to be able to share, but they also like to be able to make money. money. <laughs> and one of the challenges there is, well, let's say I create a piece of art that borrows something from your piece of art. Do I have to pay you for that? 
do I get to prevent others from copying my work of art so that I can charge money for it, right? That I can make a living off of my art. How do we figure out those lines is very challenging in, in art. Well, multiply that a million fold for culture and, and it gets really, really challenging to develop any kind of coherent set of laws that say, we're going to pay these people but not pay these people and we're gonna figure out how we need to legally assign the rights in this mm -hmm. intangible. And how do you uh, how do you assign particular particular values with? Um, I know that's in in the musical scene. You hear lots of times people um, challenging that one particular artist has borrowed liberally from a culture that is not their own and is now making more money than anyone mm -hmm. in that particular culture. And you know what what responsibilities do they have to you know uh, to make that somehow more fair even I mean you talk about power or give credit or give credit mm -hmm. um, give credit uh, there's issues of power but then also issues of cash and <laughs> and that uh, that tends to be a, um, a sticky a sticky place for many people so are there any pieces of culture that can be considered outside of public domain without you know that you would that it would go beyond the pale of borrowing. And we only have a few minutes here mm -hmm. left. It depends on how you define yeah. what the public Don't domain me. is <laughs> and, and what you mean. So in intellectual property law, there's a concept of a public domain, mm -hmm. which is an area in which there are no restrictions in terms of what one can mm -hmm. use. Um, Romeo and Juliet is in the public domain for purposes of copyright law because it was a written a really, really, really long time ago and we say copyright only lasts a certain period of time and after that people can copy your work for whatever purposes they want, whether they want to build on it, whether they want to make copies of it and sell them. Right? And so that's a very specific legal concept. And when I think of, of what should be outside of the public domain, it's a, it's a challenging question because that what is the public domain can become Difficult it has its own to interpretations. define. It has yeah. its own interpretations. I think if we're thinking about things that are um, uh, fair game, for example, right. what's Maybe what's that's a not way fair game? <laughs> what's not fair game? Um, I think the, the the better question is is how to use it, right? Rather than what should we use and what should we leave alone. But um, uh, appropriation is 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 going to happen. Um, the question is uh, how are things going to be made meaningful in this new context. And um, uh, you know, I would hope that that would happen with a uh, recognition of relations of power, but also a recognition of the historical uses mm -hmm. of those symbols and what they have been used to mean in the past. Um, and then a really creative sense about what they might be made to mean in a new way. Um, and um, thinking carefully about uh, what those new meanings might do in a social sense, so. Right. Very nice. Well, it seems as though that despite the particular victory uh, last June over the Washington Redskins, cultural interactions and sensitivity are something that cannot be legislated per se, but are dependent upon an individual's willingness to interact with each other in respectful ways. And upon continuing conversations like this one, and perhaps more uh, inclusive conversations even than this one, as you pointed out, Kristen. I'd like to thank each of my panelists here this morning and you for joining us. We hope that you have a good morning. And on behalf of the Interreligious Council, thank you.